everybody. My name is David San Pedro. I am an attorney with the law firm of Panter, Panter, and San Pedro um, over in Pinecrest, Florida. And uh, we like to say um, to let us help you, um, let us represent you and your family. And um, we've been involved in the community for many years. Tell you a little bit about um, our office and uh, the history of our office. It was started uh, by Brett Panter back in. Um, in the 90s, um, 1991 is when he graduated from um, uh, law school, and soon thereafter, uh, his brother Mitchell Panter joined them, and they started a law firm of um, of Panter and Panter. I, I joined them in 1996, and and fast forward a little bit, a couple more gray hairs on my face, um, and it's uh, here we are in, in 2021. And um, the law firm is Panter, Panter, and San Pedro. Um, we've always been involved in the community. We've always um, tried to give back to the community, whether it's the local community or the legal community. And uh, we often get uh, phone calls from prospective clients who are calling or inquiring uh, into an area that we do not practice. We limit our practice to the area of personal injury. We help people who've been hurt or injured. Um, maybe they've had a family member who've been hurt, injured, sometimes killed as a result of the negligence of another person or another company. Um, but there were a lot of calls that we were getting in areas of laws that we did not practice. We did not have an area of expertise. So um, probably about, um, I want to tell you, it was about 12, 15 years ago, we started a referral network and started off with a simple concept where we uh, sent out postcards to um, members uh, of our legal community. And, um, and some of those responded, we interviewed them um, and made them part of the Panter, Panter and San Pedro referral network. And, and the idea was to make sure that our office would never say no, um, we don't do that or we don't know anybody who does that when somebody would call us in an area uh, of law that we didn't practice in. We wanted to make sure that we would be able to refer them to somebody else, uh, another expert in a um, legal area that we did not necessarily focus in and tried to make sure we had people from all over South Florida. We have members in um, in Dade and Broward predominantly, but certainly other members. And And these individuals collaborate with um, not only our office, but with one another. And uh, it gives them the opportunity to refer business back and forth uh, amongst the various members in the network. It also um, gives them the opportunity to seek support. And it might be information about either a new area of law or um, or getting to know an attorney in a, in a different area. And um, we've tried to encompass every area of the law. And um, as a further step of that collaboration, we wanted to bring it out to the community and introduce different individuals who practice in different areas of the law. Um, and today uh, I am joined by one of those individuals, one of our, indi one of our um, uh, first members, she was um, part of the original referral network, um, Patu, Patu practices in immigration law. Say, say hello, Patu. Good morning, everyone. And Patu, you did say a little bit about um, uh, you practice in immigration law. Is that correct? Yes, I am a sole practitioner. Okay. Um, I have a uh, boutique style type of uh, immigration practice. Uh, in downtown Miami. All right. And tell us, how did you get involved with the referral network? And tell us a little bit about that, how you first learned about it, how you joined it. I was one of the first ones who got the postcard, the okay. original postcard. Right. And being a sole practitioner, like you said, you know, like it's, it's hard to, you know, you develop a relationship with a client. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, we become their go-to person. Right. And, uh, and I've experienced the same situation where people would call me, you know, like I represent a lot of foreigners and they come here and they open businesses and they try to immigrate to the United States and, uh, and they would call me, you know, uh, I've been involved in an accident, you know, uh, I have a, a, a legal issue, a commercial issue. And I, at first, you know, I really didn't have people to refer them to. And I felt that, you know, I need to get more involved although at that time i did a lot of um um networking sure so uh, as a matter of fact we met in one Correct. of those Correct. but uh i but, seem to remember 2005 2006 we met we had lunch uh, with the office we introduced you to the network and you joined i think way back then yes and then you know i called 
and I think you guys had, you know, like the introduction uh, dinner, whatever it was, and and uh, and it's been a great experience to and be part of the network. Have you had an opportunity to either um, receive referrals from the network, or give referrals, or collaborate with other attorneys? In Absolutely. Areas well? As a matter of fact, you know, I've had sometimes when uh, when it's an when it's not my area or a different area, different state. You know, uh, through the network, I've been able to get to attorneys who've been able to help my clients. So it's been a very positive experience for me. That's for sure. Great. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. I'm glad that we've been able to help with that. So you mentioned a little bit about that you had a boutique style um, immigration practice. Well, tell us what you mean by a boutique um, firm and, and tell us a little bit about your immigration practice. Maybe give us an example of a typical case that, that you would work on. Yeah, I love what I do to begin with. Good. And uh, so basically, you know, what I mean by a, a boutique practice is that, you know, I give individual attention to my clients. So that means if they call the firm, they're going to talk to you, they're going to talk to the attorney. Yes. You know, they first, you know, speak with, with my assistant and uh, it depends on where they come from. You know, sometimes I offer like a 15 minute um, a bonus consultation because uh -huh. in 15 minutes basically at that point i can have an idea if it will be worth it to have a um, a formal consultation right. or if it's something that i don't think the person has a case so i've been doing that since you know since 2020 with the with the pandemic that was right. a way that i could adjust but basically you know uh yes you know i'm the one that basically deals with the with the with the client Okay. All right. Great. So, and give us, uh, I mean, immigration law, I guess I can mean, a, you know, obviously it's trying to immigrate to, to our country, the United States, but there's different types of individuals. Some might want to do it because they're trying to escape economic hardship or personal relationships, join their families, other have business interests. Tell us um, a little bit about a typical case that you might handle. Well, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while. So basically, when I first started, I did uh, at that time, I was working on asylum cases, political asylum okay. cases. And I started backwards because I started doing appeals so I could see what other attorneys maybe had missed, what, you know, Monday morning quarterback type of situation. And when you say political asylum individuals who may have been persecuted in their home country or their native country for political reasons. Right. It, Humanitarian type of relief. And then from that, you know, I migrated a little bit towards business immigration, which uh, became the bulk of my my practice for a while. And how's that different to business immigration? Um, well, uh, different types of clients. OK, so are these individuals who are coming maybe because um, uh, they work for a large corporation who want to come over here, maybe an internationally well-known chef? Sometimes, um, okay. you know, sometimes all of that, you know, uh, artists, artists, okay, um, athletes, perhaps who athletes, you know, um, or persons who are, you know, executives, or they own companies abroad, and they want to start a business here, and they basically, you know, can be transferred here to, to manage the business. Uh, ex as executives or managers. Okay. And I'm assuming if they inject some money into the economy, for example, hire individuals, start a company, that's something that might be considered um, yeah. in the immigration process? Investors, okay. yes. You know, um, yeah, you know, uh, now, you know, like uh, persons who have um, um, expertise that, you know, could be useful here, they'd like to bring that expertise here and work in that field. Um, so those are, and then the, you know, back to, uh, family based immigration, you know, like someone who marries a foreigner. Well, and, let's talk about that a little bit. So can someone who comes to the United States, um, possibly as a tourist and they never go back to their home country, you often hear about this and you hear that, you know, they fall in love and get married. Sometimes it's, you know, oftentimes it's legitimate. Sometimes it can be illegitimate, but they marry an American citizen. Um, can that person expect to be granted uh, asylum or get residency here in the United States? Sure. You know, uh, like the uh, U.S. citizen can mm -hmm. petition for the foreign be beneficiary. Okay. The per like, for instance, uh, the law excuses the per if the person comes here and s overstays, you know, the uh, the petitioner can uh, file for the for the spouse uh 
and even same sex spouse. Okay. And um, and petition for the person to come and live in the United States. You know what? Sometimes people don't want to understand is like basically there's a two part of of the the process. Okay, tell us about that. The first part is the right of the U.S. citizen to petition. Uh, for the uh, spouse. Okay. And the second part of it is that the person needs to be admissible to the United States. How is that determined? So basically, let's see. Um, I'm going to give you an example because uh, let's see if you marry a, a foreigner. All right. And you petition for the foreigner and the first part of the process gets approved. Okay. You have the right to have your your, your spouse here. Okay. But then that's the second part of the, uh, of the equation, which is uh, the admissibility of the beneficiary. So let's assume that uh, the spouse was uh, convicted of uh, rape. Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> then, you know, even though you have the, the first part of the process was approved, this person may not be admissible. Sure. So, you know, may not even be advisable to marry that person. <laughs> but Okay. But anyway, that I, I gave you like a like a, sure, a extreme radical example. Like, I, I extreme example to, so to, people to will understand. understand. You know, but uh but basically that's why it is, you know, sure. yes, you know, US citizen can petition for someone who's who arrived in the United States as a tourist and overstayed their their uh their period, you know, their the, what's right. called their I-94. Okay, and the I-94 being a, a, a tourist visa that they apply for, it might expire, and but if they end up marrying somebody um, under certain circumstances, they might be able to stay. Right, yeah, the I-94 is basically like you get a visa on your passport, and that's basically an authorization that you can, you know, a multiple entries, you can come in and out of the United States. During the but, period of that, of that, that, that of, visa. Um, the validity of that okay. visa. But then, you know, Homeland Security will determine how long you can stay. All right. So, for instance, generally when a when a, uh, a tourist comes here, they get six months. They're allowed to stay here for six months. But, you know, the uh, 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 Customs and Border Protection will basically determine how long the person can stay. If they say, if you say something when you're at the airport and they feel like, okay, uh, I'm going to give you two weeks, they can tell you that even though you have a visa for five years or for 10 years on your passport, they're going to determine how long you can stay. So what I meant was like, if someone comes here uh, with a tourist visa and they get six months, but they don't go back after the six months. Right. So they overstay okay. the period and they don't file for an extension or anything. They overstay the period that they were authorized to stay and they meet someone uh, three years later. Okay. So they've been here all this time as an overstay. Yes, you know, assuming that the person is admissible, okay, then the uh, the U.S. citizen can petition for this person, and then and to they stay. can file for an adjustment of status. Are some countries um, do some countries are they treated differently? For example, somebody who might be coming from from Great Britain or or Canada as opposed to South or Central America, for example, are, are countries treated differently by um, Homeland Security or or INS? That's hard to say. They shouldn't. Okay. You know, but um, at least not on paper. They're they're not treated differently no, on paper. No. I understand. Well, let's stay on the subject of of family immigration. So let me ask you this: Let's assume somebody is here; they're a legal resident. Could they petition to have possibly their their parent come from their home country or a sibling, a brother, or a sister? Once they've established residency here in this country. Can it be a little easier for them to petition to have a family member to come to the country? You mean if they have a green card? Yes, of course. Right. Okay, yeah. If well, a, a green card holder that would be a legal resident, correct? Right. A legal okay. permanent resident could cannot petition. They can petition for a, a spouse, um, a, a minor child, or an unmarried uh, child. At any age. Okay. But they can, a, a legal permanent resident cannot petition for a sibling or a parent. Okay. You have to be a U.S. citizen so to you, petition for a, a parent or for a, a, a sibling. A sibling. So that that um, legal resident with a green card would have to um, apply to become a U.S. citizen. And once they become a U.S. citizen, then they could go through that process. Right. And is that something that they can go to an immigration attorney such as yourself to help them with that process? You know, I get that question a lot. You know, and uh, and I also explain to people that, you know, I'm not trying to sell my services. 
you know, I'm not saying you can go to whoever you want to go. But one thing that really it's a pet peeve of mine is like how sometimes even uh, immigration and downplays uh, immigration practice as to just completing forms. An application. Yeah, yeah. an application. And they don't understand the implications behind it. Right. You know, and uh, so I advise people to always speak with an attorney because sometimes they just don't understand you know, uh, how to answer questions. For instance, when I first started practicing, forms were very short. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, forms are very long. And sometimes they have yes and no questions that people just kind of like answer no, 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 no. And they don't understand. For instance, you know, like, um, have you ever uh, uh, violated the terms of your non-immigrant visa? You know, for some types of cases, if you've worked, as a tourist, you violate it. And if you answer yes or no, and sometimes, yes, you know, people do come to me, oh, you know, a friend of mine, because they always know somebody, a cousin, you know, (laughs) a friend of mine, you know, uh, had no problem. What they don't understand is that, yes, sometimes these things happen, that they don't pick up when the person, you know, violated their visa or whatever, or the terms of the visa. But then later on, it could become a problem. Of course. And that's something, unfortunately, from what I've heard, is very prevalent in some um, communities that have a lot of immigrants, that they have um, people who describe themselves as notarios, because that has a different meaning in in certain countries and in Latin America than it does here in the United States. And and they fall into that trap. and, And then they have to go to an immigration attorney such as yourself. And at that point in time, now the process has become a lot more complicated. Is that right? Right. And they don't understand you because a lot of these people uh, that call themselves notarios, you know, they're they're attorneys wherever they are. Right. Okay. So they sometimes they even say, oh, you know, I said, you know, like somebody has a consultation and they present a case to me. And I said, you know, so, oh, no, but so and so is an attorney. I said, an attorney where? Right. They're not they're not legally licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or anywhere in the United States, but possibly maybe in their home country. They were right. And sometimes churches and like I said, you know, they downplay uh, immigration practice to completing a form. Sure, I understand, you know, and they don't understand. And sometimes, you know, things can get very complicated and sometimes impossible to uh, I hate I hate to say the word fix it, but. To, to help to, the to deal with the situation right. and try to put them in a better position as they were before. Right. So let me ask you, because you do say it's a little confusing and obviously we don't practice any immigration law. I've never practiced it, but um, in speaking with attorneys such as yourself, there's often you hear these phrases and you, you, you just went through I-94 and you just said that <laughs> and, and, um, and you said that like it means something. But the other one I often hear is, is K-1. Um, what, is, what is a K-1? K-1 is a, as a matter of fact, they have a reality show about that. It's okay. like a fiancé visa. Okay. All Basically, right. you know, you have to be a U.S. citizen to petition. Let's see you uh, met someone. Uh, you traveled on vacation. Oh, not you because you're married. but <laughs> I am. <laughs> the person, my wife tells me that. <laughs> the person married to, uh, uh, went on vacation and met someone, okay, and fell in love. And then the the U.S. citizen comes back here. And then, uh, you know, the K-1 visa was basically created to try to uh, make the, you know, so the process would be faster for the person to get here. So this U.S. citizen can petition for this uh, foreign uh, beneficiary for this person to come here and uh, uh, as a fiance and then uh, has to get married within 90 days. I see. Okay, and then apply for adjustment of status. Okay, so they would use the K one to bring somebody to the United States that they intend on on marrying and having obviously um, a, a a legal spousal relationship with. Right. All right. Fair. Fair enough. So let me ask you this: If how about somebody who is in another country and they apply for a visa and they get denied, um, can that person reapply for the visa? For example, I get that question a lot okay. because um when you um when you're applying for a visa you have to complete an, an online uh application with the department of state and of course you know uh, sometimes people hire people to do that for them and they have no idea 
you know, what happened, you know, how they did it. So basically, um, when somebody gets uh, applies for a visa, like a, um, I'm going to give you an example, like a, a tourist visa. Okay. And, and the visa is denied. Sometimes the person um, immediately reapplies for it. So what I always try to do is to try to request, you know, when somebody comes to me with that situation, I always try to request the file from the Department of State so we can see what happened and the re what was the reason for the denial. And that's something that you're entitled to, to get the file from the Department of State. Right. You get the file. It takes a while. But once someone has had a denied visa, I always like to get more information because sometimes the late person doesn't really understand what happened. Okay. You know, uh, because they they get a denial and uh, they don't know what happened. Right. Also, one situation that happens is like some when someone is uh, travels to the United States and when they get to the airport for some reason they are not admissible. Okay. And uh, customs, you know, the, the the official there at the airport asks if the person wants to to uh, withdraw their uh, application for admission. And they are sent back. And then the person says, oh, you know, you can reapply for your visa. You know, and someone like just immediately reapplies for the visa, you know, without knowing exactly what happened. And without consulting an immigration attorney. Yes, because they're told by the officer, oh, you can reapply for the right. visa. But that's it. You know, so basically that's a situation that when someone gets uh, uh, applies for a visa abroad and they get denied, they don't necessarily... Uh, uh, the person is not necessarily barred for life. You have to investigate exactly Why what right? happened to make sure it doesn't happen again. Right, because I've had many situations of that. You know, once we found out and we were able to reapply, sometimes we had to wait. All right, you know. So, uh, and I know sometimes there there are overlaps with immigration and other areas of law, such as um, criminal law, for example, and. Um, uh, the situation that I've heard happen from time to time is that somebody's here possibly on a tourist visa and they are accused of a crime and uh, they go back to their home country before the criminal investigation is complete, for example. And at some point in the future, they return to the United States. Um, can they be detained? How does this affect their immigration status? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? That's actually a very common situation. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, young kids, they come here, they get into a bar fight or whatever, right. and they leave before uh, the case, the criminal case is completed. So uh, basically, you know, then the person is, you know, what do I do? So the, the criminal case continues whether or not the person is here. So sometimes the warrant is issued. One, one aspect of it doesn't have anything to do with the other. In other words, the state attorney's office has not, does not deal directly with um, the Department of State or Homeland Security. They don't always work together, correct? Right. You know, they, sometimes they just don't know. The person is, is supposed to... to appear for a hearing, you know, they bail out or whatever, whatever happens. And then a warrant is issued. Okay. So I've had situations like that in the past, including I've, I've, uh, one, one guy was actually in Hawaii. And I remember this because I contacted the network, Okay, you know, and, uh, and I asked if anyone knew an attorney in, in, in Hawaii. Hawaii and going from member to member, I was able to get to an attorney in, okay. in, in Hawaii. All right. Okay. Who cleared the warrant. Okay. And, uh, because it was a criminal defense attorney in Hawaii. I'm right. You know, and in, this, the, this been a lot of years, the but referral network, um, expands all 50 States apparently. Right. Wonderful. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. Cause people, you know, we know each other. Oh, you know, of maybe, course. you know, Oh, I had, a, I have a colleague that actually moved to this state. You know certainly, what I'm saying? Certainly. Of course. So basically, you know, in that situation, the person was able to clear the warrant and, you know, everything and was, that, was that in turn facilitates the immigration process. Right. Okay. You know. Okay, so that's an example of of where you because you don't practice criminal law, am I correct? No. So, um, and since there is some overlap, um, you needed the assistance of a criminal defense attorney to be able to um, get rid of the warrant, um, exonerate the person, whatever they were accused of, and then you use that to facilitate the application process to so they can come to the country legally and obviously. Stay. Right, because then at that point, depending, you know, how, you know how our how 
you know, our work is, you know, nothing is simple. <laughs> right. Of course. Of course. <laughs> but um, it's not always the lawyer's fault, but that, that is true. Right. Yes. So basically, you know, um, at that point, when you're going to submit a new application for a visa, then you have to explain, you know, what what happened. You know, what happened. Because when you answer yes or no, then, you know, you get the chance to explain. Okay. So as long as they know, like when the person uh, goes to the consulate for the for the in person interview, you know the the representative already knows what's going on. You okay. know what I'm saying? Sure. And then you of know, course. but if it's if it's something that the person hides, and then eventually they find out. Let's assume that someone has a warrant and they applied for a visa and they lied and they for some reason they did get the uh, the visa. Understood. So then what happens is that when the person is here, you know, at the airport, maybe at that time they're going to find out, oh, this person has a warrant. So, yes, there is a risk that the person could be detained at that point. All right. So I know we've been talking a lot about the the, the personal immigration process. Let me jump for a second um, back over to the business side of it. Is that an area that you're familiar with as well and, and that you do, in other words, help individuals who are coming for business purposes as we start yes. talking about? All right. And um, especially in South Florida, obviously, um, there's a lot of uh, individuals and there's a, a huge makeup from all parts of our country, not just from Latin America, but from Europe as well. Whether you're on Brickell or downtown, you can certainly get that flavor of it. So tell us a little bit about that. Can you give us an example of a business visa? Why somebody who's a business owner uh, may want to reach out to an immigration attorney? Well, I'm going to be like, uh, I have, I speak Portuguese fluently. Okay. I learned Spanish here in Miami. It's okay. not that good, but I speak a, a portuñol. Okay. Yeah, a little so, bit, enough to communicate. <laughs> enough to communicate. <laughs> so basically a lot of Brazilians have dual citizenship. Okay, like for instance, they they're Brazilian and they're Italians. Okay. So, be, having an Italian passport qualifies them for a for a, an E visa. An E okay. visa. Yes, it which okay. is an investor's visa. Okay. So basically, that person could come here and open an, uh, uh, control an American company and come here to uh, to uh, develop the business okay. here. Okay. Start a business so, here in the United States and and obviously hopefully employ individuals and so on and so forth. Exactly. And that may help their process as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's one one of the examples. Okay. All right. And um how, how about an executive at um, a lot of these large firms are coming over to to South Florida. Um, maybe there's an employee that they want to bring and there's an executive who may want to reach out to an immigration attorney to help bring a prospective employee is, is yeah that there's else? a they can transfer an executive you know assuming that there is a a company uh uh outside of the united states a multinational and wants to start a company here in the united states you know there are some requirements there has to be control and Perfect. there has to be a relationship between the uh i mean it, there are requirements but yes you know, the short answer is yes. You know, they can transfer someone to come here, work as an executive or as a manager. Okay, fair enough. So, but at the end of the day, regardless of uh, of whether it's personal or, or business, I think the goal for many of these individuals who you seek your services is to become a United States citizen. Right. Um, how long does that take? Um, can you help with that? Tell us a little bit about that process. Generally speaking, um, uh, you have to wait five years you know, if you're married to a U.S. citizen, you have to wait three years, but you can actually file the application, you know, uh, uh, 90 days before the anniversary. Okay. And then um, take a test and, and is that a process? You still have to take an, an oral or a written test or is it both to become a Yes, you have to take an oral test unless you qualify for an, except, an exception, you know, and uh, an exemption. And uh, but yes, you know, it's a process that uh, could take uh, actually, you know, right now they're moving naturalizations pretty fast. OK, uh, I just had an amazing experience. You know, it's unusual experience where uh, I filed for my client in uh, the end of June. And believe it or not, she was a U.S. citizen with her naturalization certificate uh, a month and a half later. Wow. But great. this was an unusual situation. Of it course. takes about uh, generally, you know, like uh, uh, four months, six months. It depends. It depends on where you file. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, as, as we're getting ready to, to wrap things up, I know that this is, can be a very complicated area of law. There's a lot of questions 
that we I'm sure have not addressed today. We've only touched upon a couple. So if somebody maybe had additional questions and they wanted to reach out to you, uh, what's the best way for one of our viewers to communicate with you and um, and get a hold of you, try to talk to you, try to set up an appointment? They can call uh, my office, 305-358-9440. 305-358-9440, is yeah. that right? Yeah, and if they mention this uh, story, you know, they can get like a, a bonus consultation in okay, 15 like minutes. A, yeah. Okay, a free consultation if they mention the um, the, the, the Panner, Panner and San Pedro Law Talk. So now you all know what you need to do if you want to reach out to Patu. Um, and I'm assuming that that's probably the, the best way they can do it. If you have any um, doubts or, or questions, you weren't able to get the number, which Patu is going to give it to us one more time. 305-358-9440. All right. If you have any doubts or questions, you can always reach out to our firm. Um, you can either call us at 305-662-6178, or you can um, you can look at our webpage, which is um, panterlaw.com, or you can just um, Google us, Panter, Panter, and San Pedro. I'm sure that um, you're going to get a top hit right there from our law firm, and you can reach out to us, and we can certainly put you in contact with Patu, and um, you can set up an appointment and possibly even have a free consultation so she can a answer or address any of your concerns regarding immigration law. I'm sure she'd be happy to do that. Absolutely. All right, Patu, I want to thank you very much. Um, I have enjoyed having your friendship for the last, um, it seems now, um, 15 years. I think it's it's about 15 a years. A little bit. Oh, yeah. 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 So I, I think we're both a lot time younger flies. back then. Yes. yes. Uh, so, and, um, but I want to thank you for taking the time to come thank you with for us. Inviting me. Of course. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate the um, educational tutorial that you provided with our, our viewers. And I'm certainly hopeful that um, somebody will go out there and, and reach out to you and contact you. So I'm uh, ready. All right. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Patua. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you, thank, David. Thank you all. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again uh, next week. And we want to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and happy upcoming holidays. Be safe and enjoy the time with your friends and family. Thank you very much.